Greetings, everyone. <clears throat> Good to be with you from group 11. We have a very humble group. We have some t-shirts printed up. It just says, oh, thank heaven for group 11. I'm kidding. <clears throat> but we do have a great group. Um, and it's just great to be here with you. I do want to say this, and I know that you, you're you all going to share these thoughts with me as well. I just so love this format, <clears throat> the format of that we've had recently. I've loved the format all the way along, but I love the format recently, especially of having group leaders, plus one group leaders, um, communicate their heart. There has not been a week in which I have not received just not just one, but multiple nuggets of information, some of which are just mentioned um, intentionally, some of them are just side comments of which the Lord has just owned and rammed into my heart. And so I just have really enjoyed this. So those of you who've gone ahead of us, just know um, I have, I, and I can speak on behalf of all of us, we've just been greatly blessed by this. So it's been great. Um, kind of a fun thing, personal note. Um, I, I'm not sure they're on the call yet, but they're making their way to the call. We just finished our sixth training and two of those are international so our fifth four, third and fourth training and a couple of people are going to be migrating to this call um, Ashley Misty and Mike uh, Ashley and Misty finished up the training on Saturday and Mike just finished up the training last night so if you guys are here welcome good to have you on board this is this will be their first time I thought that today, instead of just hearing from me, although if there's time left over, you will. So uh, we'll see how that goes. But if, instead of hearing from me, we hear from a couple of people who can kind of summarize what the last year or many months has been like for them on the DMM journey. And so we're going to hear from a couple of members of the group. First, we're going to hear from Tom, and then we're going to hear from Danny, and then there's time left over. You'll hear from me. So with that, Tom, I'll just introduce you. This is Tom, and I am. he is um, a brother, Paul called Timothy, a brother like no other. He's a brother like no other in terms of his passion locally and interest in DMM things. It's just so fun to have him on the team and journeying with him. And uh, he's here to just share with you his little journey. So Tom, take it away. Well, thank you, Bob. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what Wednesdays meet to me before I get into my story. Um, I shared with our lead pastor at our church Used to be one of the larger churches in Modesto. It's been contracting quite a bit recently. And I'm trying to get him a little excited about jumping onto the uh, uh, DMM fashion of doing discipleship. And it's been a, a slow go so far. But uh, I let him know that my Wednesdays are my favorite day of the week right now. And I let him know even over Sundays at this point, because you all are so encouraging to me. And uh, I am one of those guys that... Um, Although I have been a pastor for the last 15 years, um, I've been one of those guys that have been a follower of Jesus, um, but a one who is not confident in front of other people speaking about Jesus in large group settings. And I consider this a large group setting. So, so here I am um, uh, sharing a little bit about my story and especially what God has been doing in my life over this last year. And uh, so what I chose to do is just go ahead and write it down because God has been doing so many things. I didn't want to miss anything that God has been doing. And hopefully some of these things will be an encouragement to you. So a little, uh, little over a year ago, I met this guy named Bob. And um, I knew nothing at all about DMM. I was out walking the neighborhood and happened to be passing in front of his house. He lives about a block away. And out he trots to the to the uh, mailbox to pick up his mail, and I start an in, uh, a conversation with him, and it leads into going into his house and him inviting me over to his home to hear a little bit about this thing called DMM, which I had never heard of. So um, that two hour uh, meeting that I had with him that that day left my head spinning. So first, let me tell you a little bit of background about myself. I became a believer in Jesus at the age of 20. Uh, it was 1970, and the Jesus movement was in full swing, and I was right in the middle of it. I became active in a large growing church here in Modesto, California, Central Valley, after graduating from college, and eventually got involved in leadership there at the church. Uh, a few years later, I met my wife-to-be, who was also involved with, in leadership there, uh, and continued in leadership uh, over in the adult ministry area over the years. At age 50, uh, God called me to leave, uh, leave the business world and to become a children's pastor at that church. Uh, 
had about 600 kids there on Sunday mornings. And uh, so uh, I enjoyed leadership of people. And uh, so that was my forte. And I loved uh, uh, meeting with the uh, leaders in the children's area of which we had about 70 at that time. Uh, so I, I did that. I retired at the age of 65, uh, continuing to be uh, involved in leadership there at the church. And it was then that I, I met Bob on that walk. And uh, boy, uh, has my life changed. Upon, about, upon hearing about DMM, there was one thing that I could not shake, and it was the Great Commission. I thought I was doing okay in that area, and I believed I was doing good in making disciples. Uh, but for some reason, the words go and make disciples was not understood by me. I was doing a little of that, but in reality, I was relying on people to come to me, primarily in a church environment. Uh, I knew this had to change after that meeting, and I knew that I was commanded by Jesus himself to be a goer. Bob started coaching me in DMM staff and uh, began showing me how to go about being a goer. To be, a, uh, to be an effective goer, the first thing I needed uh, to do was to be focused on God's word. Over the years, I've been very faithful to that on almost a, a daily basis but I was now challenged to take it to a new level. I was challenged to really meditate on what I was reading in each morning and coming up with one thing that God spoke to me about personally and then turn that one thing into a prayer back to God and focus on that one thing through the day. And I continue to do that to this day. This was the beginning of multiplying extraordinary prayer for me as well. My wife and I also look forward to spending an hour with Bob and his wife each week, praying for specific things to happen locally and with those we are influencing towards disciple making. So Bob, I love that prayer time that I had with you each hour, each, each week. I'd already been involved in going out among the lost, uh, delivering food on a weekly basis prior to meeting Bob. I was doing this to some elderly who lived in a high rise apartment uh, complex that was government subsidized here in Modesto. Uh, I now have much more meaningful spiritual conversations with those residents and I'm doing a one-on-one -on -one discovery Bible study now with one of those residents there uh, in the apartment. This never would have happened without the training. Just about the time I met Bob, I was getting involved in a nonprofit that provides uh, drug and alcohol treatment uh, for women. Uh, at one facility, and at the other facility, they provi provide a long-term clean and sober living uh, facility uh, at, at, at that location. I was learning about access ministry from Bob, and uh, there was great opportunity, I, I believe, there uh, as, I, as I desired to make disciples and saw the opportunity right there uh, at both of those facilities. Uh, after casting vision, vision to the executive director there and spending a few weeks there uh, with he and his house, house managers doing Discovery Bible Studies, they agreed that I needed to do that with the entire staff there, both their facilities. And uh, so these last uh, six months or so, I've had the joy each week of spending an hour uh, with the staff, uh, there was about 10 at one facility, eight at another facility, going through uh, Discovery Bible Studies and other things that uh, uh, I've learned through the DMM. About uh, six months ago, I got approved to be a volunteer chaplain at our county jail. Uh, over this time, God has brought five inmates into my life, and I try to meet with them weekly via an, an internet visit through the uh, prison portal that's available. Uh, one dropped out fairly early, uh, but the other four have become like brothers to me. Uh, they are so appreciative of the depth of love God has for them, uh, and they, they were really lost. Uh, they are drawing close to God now, and they are sharing what they are learning with their cellies, as they call them. The inmate I'm, inmate I'm currently meeting with shared that he had a girlfriend who uh, needed food. Uh, she lived on the outside here at a in a kind of a low-income area just outside of Modesto, and he gave me your phone number. Uh, many of you know Conrad. Uh, 
because she needed food, uh, Conrad was the guy I wanted to go to because of the food ministry that he has through his church here in Modesto. Uh, and boy, did he accommodate. Uh, she had no vehicle, so my wife and I went and picked her up. Uh, we headed over and, and loaded up our car with food, took her home. And on the way back, we had some pretty significant uh, spiritual conversation with her. She is not a believer, made it very clear that she was not, but uh, and had no spiritual background at all. Uh, but after shorting our short uh, testimonies with her and then uh, asking her, you know, if God could do a miracle in your life, what would you ask him for? She says, uh, well, I really need a car. I used to be, a, when I had a car, I was able to make a living doing DoorDash and a couple other things. And uh, I could really make more income than earning money under the table at this market that I'm working at. And uh, so we said, uh, okay, let's pray for a new car. And as on the drive back, we're praying for a new car and delivered the food. And of course, we had our phone number. And my wife started picking up on the follow up after that. And uh, within a week, uh, we, uh, in, in the contacts, actually through the contact that I was making with the inmate uh, that I met with weekly. He said, did you hear? And I hear, hear what? She got a car. <laughs> and uh, I go, you got to be kidding me. And I said, no, I, I should have trusted God more on that one. But he answered that prayer and provided a car. She has to, she has to very favorable terms for a friend who, who gave the car to her. And she's right now still able to make the payments required for her to keep that car. So, so that's been a good thing. Um, my wife continues to stay in contact with her. And uh, that's been pretty exciting to see as well. For years, I've been leading a, uh, you know, kind of a traditional Bible study kind of a thing here at our church, with, uh, at our home with people from our church. And um, I shared with them shortly after getting involved in the DMM stuff uh, that I wanted to do a course change in our, in our home group. And uh, so uh, I said, uh, we're going we're gonna to start doing things a little bit differently. And I told them the reason why, as far as casting vision, as to why we, we need to make this change. Because like me, they were pretty much ingrown as far as who they were ministering to in their life. And it was with people and friends within the church. And uh, so I shared that vision with them and uh, started doing that. And I said, this is just like a two-month commitment. And uh, so you can decide what you want to do after two months. Uh, but this is the direction we're going in, and we're just going to keep going that way. This is, I believe that's what God wants me to do. Well, after a couple of months, uh, half the group decided to bail, and they wanted to go to a more traditional type of a Bible study than going through a DBS style of Bible study. So they weren't ca quite catching the vision that I was uh, uh, casting before them, but the other half of the group was. And uh, uh, so God has been doing some great things in our in our. Uh, Discovery Bible study here at our home. Uh, since then, uh, a neighbor next door has joined in, uh, a, a couple across the street uh, uh, from us uh, has joined in as well. Um, they're involved in another church, but he is the husband is very interested in DMM type of stuff. And I'm he's been leading when I'm unable to participate. And uh, so uh, I've been training him to do that as well. And he's really looking forward to someday having a group of his own and doing it uh, and participating and leading in that fashion and training others to do the same. So that's been cool. And then uh, this, just this last Sunday, I was, um, we had uh, about three weeks ago, we had a big neighborhood kind of get together, just a very secular get together type of a thing. But I got to know uh, a neighbor a lot better that lives a couple doors down from me and discovered that he had a, a, a like uh, mindedness of golf uh, that I had. And uh, so, and it just happened that he happened to belong to the, the nicest country club in the area. And uh, which, uh, you know, I'm a golfer and I very rarely get to play that course. And uh, he says, let's go play sometime. So uh, he's been trying to get together with me and this last Sunday was the day. And uh, so I said, okay, hopefully, and praying for the spiritual conversation that can happen with my friend two doors down. And he and I, our golf level's about the same, so I knew that we were going to have a lot of fun out there. And uh, so we had a, uh, not a great round of golf, but we had a good time being together. And I uh, got back, and on the drive home, I uh, got to the spiritual conversation end of things. And uh, he had shared that uh, he had, what, at one time, 
had uh, been close with God, but by the time he got to be an adult, he was pretty much not interested that uh, church uh, basically was, he was really disappointed with church in general. And, but he was very interested in God and uh, on occasion had, was having some uh, devotionals uh, with his wife. Uh, as they had both had a prior marriage. And uh, so uh, they were, had had conversations about wanting to pursue God with their life, but had never taken any action, but really weren't interested in pursuing it through church. And so it was a perfect opportunity just to talk about our discovery group that we had at our home. And he just uh, bubbled up and was very excited about that. As, and he said, my wife will be really excited about that because her first marriage was terrible. And as a result of her first marriage, she, um, she discovered God and she needed God in her life and, and, and received Christ. And, and, but has, since being married with, uh, they just really haven't pursued that knowing that they needed to. So he says, we're gonna jump in. So I'm hopefully in the next week or two, we'll see them here at our doorstep. He's a, he's a trauma nurse, so he sees everything in his uh, work. And uh, uh, so he's around death all the time and he sees opportunity to share with people that he nurses basically through that trauma unit that he's in. And he wants to do that. So I'm looking forward to see what God might be doing in both he and, and his wife's life. So uh, that's been pretty cool. And I'm also really excited that my wife, uh, see, I've been, I've been at this for just about a year now. And my wife has been with me the whole time, supporting and encouraging, but not really jumping in to near the level that I've been jumping in. But just in recent, uh, in the recent weeks, and I'd say in the month, month or so, she has had opportunities through referrals from Bob, through conversations that he's had with other females that it might be best to have a woman meet with them, that uh, she has picked that ball up and is, she's now working with three different ladies that are pursuing God in their life and influencing them. So I'm really encouraged about that. But in summer, I wanted to share just a few things that God has shown me uh, and the, the lessons that I've learned through some of the DMM stuff that I've been doing. Uh, first, uh, I needed to go outside my church uh, to make disciples. Um, uh, I'm still involved in disciple making within the church, but I really needed to go outside. Uh, second, uh, don't be surprised where he sends me. If a, if a year and a half ago, someone would have said, Tom, you're going to be doing this, 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 this. I say, you're nuts. Uh, but uh, here I am doing it. And I'm so thankful for the path that God has brought me down. Uh, the third thing is be patient. Um, uh, God got me on fire. You know, I, I know I'm approaching the end of my life. You know, I'm in the, in the last chapters of my life at the age of 73. And uh, I'm so thankful that uh, I've, I got here this late in stage in life that I've been missing out on. So I, Chris, I read your book and, and uh, heard a little bit of that uh, from you. It, through your book and the encouragement that I got through that. And um, so it's, it's never too late is, is what I've got to say on that one. And, but uh, I'm just so excited that uh, where God has brought me and I need to be patient with my leadership uh, uh, in this third thing, be patient. Um, uh, I love our church. I, I love our lead pastor. I love the staff. You know, I've got uh, I've got 53 years of involvement in this church and seen a lot of good people leave and a lot of good people are still there. And I love them deeply, uh, but they still, for the great majority, most are not wanting to engage in the fashion that I believe Jesus has commanded us to engage. So um, I keep, uh, I have opportunities to speak in front of the church on a couple of occasions here in this last year about disciple making. And uh, a few are interested, most uh, are just comfortable with where they're at. So I'm really praying for God to change and help me to, with my impatience sometimes and helping me be more patient. And uh, with those I'm discipling, with the many that I, I just say, come on, you gotta run. You, but they're, they're pretty moving along at a pretty slow pace, but they're moving forward. So I've gotta be patient with the slow growth that I'm seeing. So I need to be patient in that, at that area as well. And the, the last thing that I'd share is this is, this is all about God. Um, 
Uh, it's not about me. It's about what God is doing, what he can do, and uh, being sensitive to the direction that he leads. And uh, so uh, we just need to be tight with him. And this uh, focusing on God's word, uh, extraordinary prayer, um, multiplying that has just been so instrumental in my moving forward. So that's what I got to share. Just been doing a little bit in my life. And as I reflect back, it's been, I'm just so thankful. So cool. Don't you all wish you had a Tom? Maybe some of you do. So that's, that's great. Tom, I want to ask you one question. Um, and, and this is, this is a, a small question in comparison to just some of the, the big issues that you've talked about, which are so fun to hear. When you transitioned from uh, a, we'll call it a legacy Bible study to a DMM style uh, Bible study, we'll call that a discovery group. We talked about um, doing what we call a launch group. And it throughout the ministry, we, we, what we encourage people to do is if you're a Christian and you've never done a discovery group before, and especially if you're a Christian in a church with other Christians, chances are you're going to have Christians in your Bible study, do what we call a launch group. And a launch group is five weeks long. That's all it is. It just lasts five weeks. After five weeks, you shut it down. You decide whether you're going to open it up again, continue, whatever. But it's a chance for the leader of that group to experience a role of facilitator and coach and for people in the group to just kind of get their feet wet with DBS. Tell us, was was that helpful? Was that effective um, going starting? What, what did you learn by just doing it for five weeks the first time, even though you rolled it over into longer terms? Yeah, well, I told you about the existing group that I had and how I processed through that, which was kind of a two-month process to see if they, they're going to be okay with that. And uh, so actually that God worked that out exactly how he wanted to do it. But as I launched this next group after that, because we did stop that group at that point, officially stopped that group and enabled the people that wanted to continue to continue. And those that did, did. And uh, then, but then as we added more people, as I started this group back up again and found some neighbors who wanted to, to join in, um, I've made that very clear that you're, this is not a commitment. Uh, this is just, we're just this, this test the waters, just dip your mm -hmm. feet in the pool and uh, see, if, see if this is something that might be working for you. And if you don't want to proceed, uh, we're stopping. And then we'll probably restart later on within a week or two after that. And uh, if you want to jump back on, great. If not, no harm, no foul. So uh, uh, that worked great. And uh, then we've had, a, since then, we've had another kind of start stop as well. And uh, so far, everybody's wanting to jump back in. And hopefully this neighbor that lives two doors down will be jumping in this, this next go around, which will start back up here in a couple of weeks. Great. So the, the advantage of the five weeks was that newcomers knew that it was just a five week commitment. So they knew what they were getting into. Yeah. It wasn't this join without any ending time kind of thing. Um, and then for you, did it give you familiarity with the role of facilitator and coach, which is a, a different role than the traditional Bible study? Did you learn the the routine and the and the, the rhythms of that? Yeah, I did. In fact, uh, I wanted to have my neighbor across the street. Uh, who has a heart for, for the lost. And he has so many unsaved friends that uh, he wants to engage in, uh, that he's getting, I think, to a point of, of feeling comfortable with doing this himself. Uh, so, so that's been my prayer. So uh, in fact, uh, one of the other guys that in our group right now, he loves, he loves to facilitate and whenever asked, he'll facilitate the group as well. And I coach each of them along. So yeah, that's worked well. Good, okay, great, thank you. Wonderful. Um, I want to introduce Danny, and Danny knows Tom, but I'll leave it up to Danny to tell <laughs> you all how he knows Tom. So, Danny, you're on. Yeah, I'm the I'm the baby in Group Eleven, man. Um, <laughs> but it's good. Um, yeah. So I was the youth pastor at Tom's church for a hot minute, like three years or so. Um, so my DMM journey started before that, basically in Illinois, we had a, um, I was youth pastor in Illinois. We had a lot of connections with the 1040 window and, um, and Greece specifically. And that's kind of where I got connected with DMM. Like, as most of us know, like overseas DMM is just kind of how people do church. Um, and we're just kind of figuring out how that works in, in America. And so I kind of got my feet wet there. Um, ended up in California and Modesto for a little bit, 
Um, Modesto, um, the church in Modesto has a pretty deep connection with the underground church in Iran. Um, and that's where I really kind of got the feed of like, this is, this is what this is. And honestly, just as most of us have been there, like caught the bug of like, man, what are we doing? We're missing the point here. So, um, shifted a lot of my focus. Um, man, gosh, sometime last October, um, basically I heard God very clearly tell me like, you're going home, you're going back to Arizona and this is what you're doing. And I said, okay. <laughs> and, and so that's what I did. Um, just kind of started reaching out to some people somehow landed in Bob's lap. Uh, not entirely sure how that worked, but, um, got connected with Bob, man, we kind of did like this whirlwind training session where it was like, we've got a month before I'm leaving. So let's figure this crap out and do the thing. So, um, went out a couple times, got trained, kind of did some things. And then, um, really, What's really interesting for me anyway in my DMM journey is um, it's just kind of been a resetting to what what feels biblical to me. Um, it, it's it's not about relearning something new for me. Every time, like, I just started eating up all kinds of, like, movement thought, like, content, whether that's DMM, CPM, like, all of the things, right? And... Um, it's like it, more and more and more. It's like, hey, this is this is how it's supposed to be. What are we doing? And um, and so yeah, so wound up back in Arizona. Um, didn't even know Tom was a whole part of the deal until, um, man, was it this call that I was like, hey, Tom, what the heck? So um, so that was good. Um, got a couple of stories I wanted to share. Bob had kind of asked us to kind of think through like what are some of the things that has kept you going? What are some of the things you've learned along this DMM journey? Um, and as I kind of like thought through the seven sales and, um, just like my DMM journey, what's, what's interesting for me is Arizona is, is kind of a little bit of a, it's a, it's a plowing ground right now. Um, there's been a couple of people that I have gotten contact with here that are like, yeah, we came for six months, couldn't really get anything started. And then we left and then, or, Hey, yeah, we're we're a big organization that's come in and we're doing our organizational thing, but there's not a ton of fruit. And so, yeah, whatever it'll, it, it's, there's, there's nobody that I've found that's really doing any of the, the real grassroots GMM movement because it's till and soil right now. Um, it's, it's the hard work. And um, I basically heard God say, I got a little frustrated when I got here because in my mind, I was like, we're going to jump in and we're just going to start making disciples and it's going to be crazy. And as all of you know, that is not how life goes. Um, and so um, I just heard God very clearly say, like, Danny, you're tilling soil. This is what you're doing. And I said, OK, if that's what you want me to do, that's what I can do. And so so it's been a very slow, ongoing process. And and so for me, the first lesson that I, I really learned is just relying on the Holy Spirit and relying on God's plan and God and relying on his timing, because it is, I don't know. I got really good as a youth pastor in the legacy church about making things happen in my own power. Um, I mean, I can, I can create a really good environment and, and move people's emotions and, and cause emotional change, but that is never really what I found the Holy Spirit wants to do. Um, and so just being able to just, be a part of God's plan and listen to what he wants to do. And sometimes that's a lot slower than we want to do has been so, so good. Um, another thing that I thought of was just the idea of going out among the lost. Um, man, I've had more spiritual conversations in the last six months with non-believers than I had the entire time I was a, a, a pastor. And like, there was a, there was a real time where I had to repent for that because like as a as a pastor of a church that should not be how that is but as you all know or most of you who've been in legacy church know like you kind of get sucked into your program and being with church people and it's what you should be doing but it's so easy to just not have conversations with um with people who are unbelievers so um i work as a paramedic um i work on an ambulance um, we do a lot of psychiatric transports, um, and we also transport a lot of prisoners. That's a lot of what we do. And 
And honestly, I think that's where Jesus would be, um, just among the homeless and psychiatric community and among the prisons. Um, those are the down and out of our world, I, I really do believe. And so um, that's kind of the backdrop of, of my story. One of the people I work with, her name is Cody. Um, she, she basically was hated out of the church. Um, she has been, she's a lesbian. She's been married to her wife for like 20 years. She grew up very strict Southern Baptist and, um, basically was hated out of the church. And so when I talk about going around out among the lost, like even at work, um, like she's got friends, but she's kind of the, the, the outcast person. Um, and so we just got to have some really cool conversations and, and she's become a good friend of mine and we've kind of coined the term. It's okay to love Jesus and not be a jerk. And, um, I really like it. And the idea in my mind is, is like going out among, among the lost means becoming friends with these people. It's not a, it's, it's not always just a, I'm going to go out and, and do my thing and then go home and leave. It means, rubbing shoulders with them, getting to know them, actually like caring about their lives, being invested in who they are. And so that was a lesson that I think I, I had to learn pretty, pretty early on that, um, man, it's messy. And, and as you read through the new Testament, like that's what the Pharisees said to Jesus all the time. How can you stay at these people's houses? How can you be friends with them? How can you know them? How can you associate with them? Like they're beneath you. And and I think it's really easy, like, to left turn into the field of like, well, I don't actually want to be around. Like, I can be with these people, but I don't want to be, like, in with these people. And and I think going out among the lost very much means being in with those people, getting to know their names, becoming their friends and things like that. And so that was a really big lesson that I had to learn. Um, the second, like, the second really big lesson actually was within the last month or so. Um, so I work on the ambulance, like I said, it is really easy in the medical field to do everything on your own power. <clears throat> you are trained like in science, quote unquote, um, you are trained in how to heal people. Um, it is really easy to go in and to do your job and never consider Jesus as a part of that. Um, and I started eh, probably about a month ago, two months ago. I've never done this in all of my paramedic career. Um, I started just praying for each of my patients before um, before they got in the ambulance, whether um, whether that's on a call, whether that's, you know, in a, in a quiet moment and the, the small quiet moments in the back of the ambulance, um, just just bathing myself in the Holy Spirit. And man, you're the healer. I don't know what I'm doing without you. And and so it has been incredible just to see not only the transformation in people's lives i very firmly believe that there are people that are healed now because the power of the holy spirit has impacted them in my ambulance not because i did anything medical to them um but there's one story i'll share um with the lady her name is dawn um i got permission to share that anybody who's freaking out about hipaa um uh, her name was Dawn and um it was just a really cool moment i don't even remember what i was taking her for um, but in the back of the ambulance, we just started talking. Oftentimes, um, we do interfacility transports, so we don't necessarily do 911 calls. Um, so she was in a, a facility and was sick and we're, and I was moving to another facility. And um, and in this, like, the spirit just prompted me in this call and was like, hey, you need to ask this lady about her spiritual life. And I said, that's weird. That's not something we normally do. It's normally something that, like, most people shy away from, but all right, God, whatever, let's do that. And so I just started asking her about her spiritual life and she, a whole new side of her opened up as, as some of you guys have had conversations with people like you, you know, that turn when it's like, Oh, there's the God moment. That's the moment that Jesus wanted me to intersect right there. And um, we got to have a really cool, just conversation about how um, she's just kind of been disconnected from Jesus was really funny as she knew a ton of people. I was a youth pastor here in Arizona for a while. Um, she knew a ton of the people that I knew, um, just kind of got away from Jesus. And she was like, I don't know. She, she told me it was really funny. She goes, I don't know why I'm in this ambulance. And I went, I do. Um, Jesus told you to the Holy spirit brought us together. And, and she's like, okay, that's probably true. But like, I didn't, she was so worried about, 
her condition and um I just got a chance to pray with her and and just to share a bible story with her and and it was a really cool moment because that doesn't often happen on on a 20 minute ambulance ride um but it was one of those things for me that I think all of that started because of prayer if if I wasn't praying and I wasn't sensitive to the spirit like I would have missed that moment that would have been another regular day where I took a patient from one place to the other and she probably would have been fine I really believe that the Holy Spirit still has the power to heal despite my shortcomings despite whatever I do but the fact that I got to be a part of that moment and to be an encouragement to her is is very very cool so I could go on forever there's plenty of stories and and things I could share but um those are kind of the two big things that stood out it's what's funny is as Tom was talking, like the things that I think we're learning together are very similar um, in very different contexts. And, um, and I don't think that is without the Holy Spirit by any means. Mm. So, so yeah, so there's my, there's my two, two second spiel. <laughs> That's great. I, I love that. So can you imagine being a patient in Danny's <laughs> ambulance and lying down there wondering, am, am I going to hear from Jesus? Am I going to hear from God? Am I going to, is, is anybody going to remind me who I am in Christ and having uh, being transported by Danny at the end of it, getting wheeled out and somebody says, can I call a pastor so he can visit you? And you'd probably just say, nope, I just had a pastoral visit. That's, that's fine. So I love it. I love it. Yeah. You get in the ambulance with Danny and you're getting in the ambulance with Jesus. How cool is that? So um, Danny Palmer asked, um, or actually John asked, how are your coworkers responding to where you are in your journey? You talked about your coworkers. How are they responding to you? You've talked about how you're responding to them. How they, you, they've seen you a little while. They've they've kind of yeah. you're the you're the God guy. What what are they saying? Um, it's really funny because you can you can immediately tell the ones that are interested and the ones that are seeking and. Um, my my current partner is one of those guys who we've had he's he's very um he's very postmodern and he kind of believes any way to heaven will get you there and we've had some really cool conversations i think like like anything they're all kind of responding in their own different ways um none of them are really like ready and willing to jump out and like start a dbs yet or things like that but I've got to pray with a lot of them. And like, like with Cody, like I prayed with her, I don't know, a couple months ago, we prayed with her, I prayed with her a number of times and it's finally kind of become a normal part of our conversation. What's really cool for me is uh, last week she had a thing happen in her life. And it was the first time that she texted me and was like, Hey, can you pray for me? And I was like, oh, you're getting this. Yes. <laughs> this is a really big step for you. Um, my coworker, I've got to be able to share stories with him and pray with him. And I think, there's there's probably five or six of them that are really receptive and responding and are are searching for the holy spirit um and so yeah i think overall it's good some of them it just is kind of you know you're just another guy doing another thing um but that's just kind of that's the nature of how jesus works and um i think the holy spirit doesn't always affect everybody and being a part of his journey is being open and listening to him and seeing who he wants to change and who he wants to affect. And so, um, so yeah, like I said, it's, it's slow going, but I've, I've been really okay with that. God's like, you're tilling soil. This is what you're doing. And I said, okay, let's do that. Cool. Great. Oh, that's just great. Um, I, I love, you can see why I love these guys um, and why, why group 11 is so much fun to, to be a part of. Um one thing that Danny didn't mention is that uh, when he first took the job as an ambulance driver, he had the night shift. So, um, and he's on the same time zone or maybe only an hour different from me. So in order to get on this call, he had to come home, go to sleep, wake up in the middle of what was his night, groggily stumble on screen, and then groggily stumble back into sleep. And he was doing it. And it was just amazing. So um, I was just so blessed by that. It was really cool. Wonderful It's still stuff. middle of the night, Bob. I still work at 7 p.m. tonight. <laughs> Oh, that, you know what? That's right. You, your station is closer. Your station is like an hour closer. That's right. Okay. So, yep. Well, thanks for taking a, a break and visiting with us in the middle of your, your night's sleep. So we love it. Good stuff. Oh, I've got 45 minutes worth of stories to tell you. And we only have about four or five minutes worth of story. We've got 
a whopping three minutes. So let me just tell you this story. Um, and this circles around and, and impacts um, with Tom and, and Lori as well. Tom mentioned that he's been blessed to have Lori participate uh, at recently, and this is kind of fun. So um, we uh, recently, the Lord impressed upon me to go out and visit the sick, and the best way to do that is go to a hospital. So I'm trying to fulfill PIPSY, not just P on PIPSY, P-I-P-S-Y. And so the the, sec, the S is sick. And so I called up uh, some hospitals in our area. We have three large ones in our area. Uh, the Lord led me to one hospital in particular and one uh, chaplain in particular and started to build a relationship with that chaplain. And turns out he himself wanted to be discipled. So we met and had a little bit of a disciple interaction as well. But I, I was casting the vision to him the whole time of, um, I want to walk the rounds with you. So I went through all the training that was necessary to become a volunteer chaplain. So I got the lanyard and all the ID and the paraphernalia and all that kind of stuff. So now I'm qualified to be a volunteer chaplain. And I called him up a week ago and I said, it's time to go on rounds. We, we got to walk the floor. Um, we, we need to do this. And so he said, okay, let's do this. So we did it. So last week we spent a little bit over an hour walking the floor. And there's two groups of people, one that we forget about in a hospital. There's patients, but there's staff as well. And so he is every bit as much um, aware of that, 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 that he's there to be a chaplain to the staff as the patient. So as we're walking in the hallways, going in and out of the doors, visiting patients, praying for them, sharing a Bible story. Do you know anybody who'd like to hear this? And, and doing it gently because we're there as chaplains. So we're just doing it very gently. We interacted with two nurses both of whom said um, I could, well, actually one of whom was so busy, we had to kind of truncate the relationship and, and really kind of figure out how to bring God into the situation. She said, um, he, the chaplain asked her, do you, do you fellowship at a church? And she's interacting with patients sitting down at her desk, receiving calls, entering stuff on the screen, that kind of stuff. And she said, um, well, I, I was Catholic, but a couple of years ago, I went to a, a Christian church for three years, but my mother-in-law found out, so now I've stopped going. So my sense is that her mother-in-law was a pretty heavy-handed Catholic and said, what are you doing? Get back into, get up, get away from those Christian church, get back into the Catholic church. And so I said, during your time visiting the Christian church, did you enjoy discovering things about God by learning them from the Bible? And she said, I really did. I said, would you like to discover those things again and not even feel like you have to go to that church and get in the crosshairs of your mother-in-law? And she said, I really would. And so um, got her, I got permission to get her name and number, shared it with Ashley, who I, I'm not sure if Ashley's on this call or not, but Ashley, if she is, this is her first, she's the one that just finished training. And Ashley said, I'll take her. And so Ashley's going to follow up with her. The other nurse was actually there, not as a nurse. She's a nurse in the ER. She was there as a patient or as the, the spouse of the patient, her husband was in, in the hospital. And um, so we talked with her. Now, her husband wasn't in the room. He was out ha undergoing testing. He is very, very sick. And they're still trying to figure out exactly what's going on with him. And so it was just her. So we, and, her, and normally you think, okay, patient's not here, turn around and walk out. We thought, nope. Um, this is kind of from the Brent Hoffman uh textbook of knock one more time than you think you should kind of thing. It's like, no, she's here. Uh, and and I kind of zone into my, my inner Jim Brits on that and just think, what would Jim do? And it's like, he'd have a conversation with her. That's what he'd do. He'd lead her to Christ. That's what he'd do. But um, anyway, so, um, and so we're talking with her and she agreed to receive prayer and she agreed to listen to a Bible story and she agreed to share it with somebody else. And in fact, she was glued to the story. She was hanging on every word of the story that we were sharing. And afterwards I said, um, would you be okay if one of the women from our, our team was to follow up with you? She said, I would really like that a lot. And she had people she wanted to share the story with. And so one of those women was Tom's wife. And so I got a text on Sunday afternoon from Lori, Tom's wife, just saying, oh, by the way, Tom and I are heading over to visit this woman um, and her husband at the, at the hospital. So they've already made a visit. Both those nurses got call, got follow-up visits within 48 hours of that time. But here's the continuation of the story. So the chaplain, we debrief after each visit. I tell them to come into my office, which is the just the hallway, basically. We're just debriefing. And so after it's all done, we debriefed a little bit and his head was spinning. He just, it's just 
amazed by this. And, and I had explained to him, but as we all know, the I get it moment is when you do it, not when you hear somebody explain it to you. So um, I said, here, let me, I cast some vision to him. I said, can you imagine this? In one hour, we got two women that need, are saying they want to know more, they want follow up. What if your church, and he's a part of a brand new startup church in town called Radiant, what if your church was trained to do follow-up and you were on the intake part generating a, a list of people who wanted to know more and you passed them along to him? And he had one of those, hmm, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? I said, wouldn't it be interesting? So I said, how about you talk to your pastor as soon as you can? So yesterday I got a text saying that he had talked to his pastor and his pastor wasn't, um, he, his pastor was reluctant only in the sense he couldn't quite figure it all out. He's still in trying to f understand what it is all in theory, but he's, he's in really wants to do this. And so he, Jeremy, the chaplain said, what do we do? I said, here's what we do. We do with him what I did with you. Your, oh, I get it moment was when I took you with me, we need to take him with us. And so we just need, and so I said, are you comfortable with me? Um, taking him with me and doing rounds. He goes, I am. Let's go ahead and do it. So so my next call is going to be to his pastor, who, by the way, he's heard of, not that I'm not famous, not that he's heard of me, I'm famous, but um, I'm also discipling a, a gentleman in his church who has shared DMM and has encouraged him to contact me as well. So my call won't be a cold call. It'll just say, I'm Bob Neiman. You've heard about me a couple places, and I'd like to invite you to, to walk the halls hallways with me. And Maybe we can train some of your church to do follow-up. So it's just neat to see how God's starting to really put it all together. So anyway, praise the Lord for how he's doing it. So um, I love just seeing it all happen. But anyway, we're, we're, we're over our time. I appreciate the time with you guys. And uh, I just love being able to share with what God's doing in our hearts and in our lives. So thanks.